uh, for our quarterly update. Uh, to my near right, Stan Lawrence, our Director of Engineering Planning, and before right, it's John Hurley, our Vice President for Water Quality Environmental Management, and I'm Carl McMorn, your Local Operations Manager. If you go to the next slide, please. This is the brief agenda that we want to cover tonight, give you an update on the PFAS, um, talk about some of the other treatment improvements we've got going on, the status of the uh, permit application for well 22 and uh, a, a larger main replacement project. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, John Hurley. Good evening. Happy New Year. Good to be with you again. Uh, I'm going to uh, provide an update on the progress we've made in 2018 relative to PFAS and drinking water. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how our water measures up against the standards recently uh, proposed by New Hampshire DES. And then I'm going to talk about our plan for managing PFAS in 2019. Uh, regarding progress, uh, we, we were very, very busy in 2018. So first of all, we minimized the use of well six. In 2016 and prior years, well six was essentially on 12 months of the year. And in 2017, we reduced that to about seven and a half months, uh, turning it off in uh, August. And in 2018, we got that down to two and a half months. So in terms of water produced from well number six, it's on the order of an 80% reduction from well number six, which is the well that has the highest PFAS levels. And that's the Mill Road well, John? That's in the Mill, Mill Road, Road well field, right. Uh, we continued our uh, sampling and testing of the well water and the tap water. Uh, 129 samples uh, and with uh, 26 compounds tested per sample, that's over 3,000 uh, analytical results reported. Uh, we completed the private well testing project with New Hampshire DES. That was uh, on the order of 75 samples. Uh, we continued the PFAS treatment evaluation and Dan will be telling you more about that shortly. We developed a new source of supply, well 22, uh, and the intention there is to use that well that has very low PFAS on the order of uh, less than five parts per trillion, to use that supply to uh, enable us to either minimize or hopefully eliminate uh, the use of the wells that have the higher PFAS levels. Uh, also, we inst installed Sentinel wells along Mill Road, so these are uh, monitoring wells, not production wells, and they're in between our production wells and some of the uh, PFAS uh, sources that are in that Mill Road area. Um, a, a big, uh, a big uh, uh, victory, uh, New Hampshire DES eliminated the PFAS discharge from the car wash, so that uh, was verified through testing that PFAS at high levels was being discharged into the aquifer, and that has ceased. It's going to take a while, uh, and I don't know how long, for uh, the PFAS uh, to be gone from the ground, probably a very long time, but at least there's no more going in at mm, present yeah. at, from that source. Uh, we continue to monitor the regulation development process uh, in uh, New Hampshire, yeah. Massachusetts, Connecticut, <coughs> uh, New York, New Jersey especially. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as you're aware, uh, New Hampshire DES did propose uh, some regulations recently. And then we had regular communication with you folks, uh, the folks from Northampton and uh, the state uh, legislators. I send out an email periodically with uh, the bar graphs and with the data table. Before we switch slides, may we ask questions? Can we let them go through their program and then we can ask questions? Oh, okay. I thought maybe we could Thank do you. one by one. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so this, this is a, a bar graph uh, showing where we stand relative to the recently proposed standards from DES. So along the bottom, we have the eight PFAS compounds that we regularly detect. Wow. Uh, the third uh, orange bar in is a standard that's been proposed for PFOA plus PFOS. And then PFNA <laughs> is a compound that where a standard has been proposed, but we really don't detect that one uh, in the drinking water in Hampton. We've 
We've detected it at very low levels in a couple of samples from well six, but of the thousands of tests we do, almost 99% of them are none detect for that compound. Mm. So New Hampshire has uh, proposed a, a, an MCL, a maximum contaminant level, which is an enforceable standard based on a legislation that was passed last year uh, of 38 for PFOA and uh, they're keeping the EPA 70 level for PFOS. Good uh, the EP level, EPA level of 70 for PFOA plus PFOS. Mm. And then they have uh, a standard uh, in the 80s for PFHXS and then a sample of uh, 22 or 23 for PFNA. That's the one we don't detect. The dark blue bar is the max level of each of those PFAS compounds that we have detected in the treated water mm. in the distribution system. Uh, and you can see those are all uh, much lower than the proposed standards in New Hampshire. Mm. The uh, light blue is the average. So for example, we monitored uh, the six distribution system points for 10 out of the 12 months in 2018. And when you take that average, you come up with those numbers. Okay, so you can see that they are much, much lower uh, than the New Hampshire proposed standards. And I think you're aware of what's going on now uh, because EPA has not taken the lead on um, reassessing and setting standards for multiple PFAS compounds, uh, individual states are stepping up oh. and setting their own standards. So that's very unusual, but it's the situation that we have right now. Uh, the uh, states like New Jersey and New York uh, have the lowest standards that I've seen in the nearby states that I've been monitoring, and uh, New York uh, has set a standard of 10 for PFOA and 10 for PFOS. So significantly lower than the New Hampshire standards. Yeah. But you can see how our water measures up against those. So the, the blue, the light blue, the aquamarine color, much, much lower. And uh, the max level, which like in the case of PFOA, that was one uh, sample. Uh, with Mel, with the mill, with well number six at Mill Road in service, uh, was uh, I think it was 11.7. Uh, so these standards may change. These are proposed, and DES is taking a public comment on those. It's possible that they could come down, uh, uh, but this is where our water stands relative to the standards as wow. proposed today. <laughs> Okay, one more slide. So our plan for this year is to continue to minimize the use of well number six. Uh, we're gonna continue our PFAS uh, testing of the well water and the treated water. Uh, we're gonna initiate sampling and testing in these sentinel wells that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that is to uh, determine if there are higher levels of PFAS than we are seeing in our wells approaching those wells. Mm. Uh, and that could lead to decisions to take those wells offline uh, if demands permit. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Dan will talk about the co uh, continuing the PFAS treatment evaluation. We need to obtain uh, approval from DES to put well 22 in service. And again, well 22, it's a high production well, very low PFAS levels, less than five parts per trillion. Uh, and getting that in service uh, will enable us to reduce the use of the higher PFAS containing wells. Uh, we'll continue to monitor the regulatory process, especially here in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm and we'll continue to communicate with you all on a regular basis. Question. Questions. Questions. Just one question on this, uh, John, and then I'll ask you to go back to the first slide. Well 22, does, does Aquarian still have the test wells on McCarran Drive going down to the wells uh, 7 and 22? Yes, we do. Okay, and 
and is that is is are the test wells relevant to any of this? Uh, well, we're, we're planning on getting a couple of sets of samples out of those just to see what's going on. Okay. Um, and hold it into this whole whole could, evaluation. Could you go back to one, sure. John? Because I had there there we go. Okay. Well, seven and well twenty two are behind me. I, I have had concern about saline contamination on well twenty two because it's lower down and it's uh, east east facing and and there is a lot of wet area down there. We haven't detected anything yet. No. No. Okay. And then the the last thing I have communicated with our state representatives um, on the. Uh, perimeters of the wells, because I am still concerned, as a resident of the state of New Hampshire, the very limited perimeter around the wells. And uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, concern at the state level, but when you have something like well 22 and well 7, where McCarran Drive goes down and water goes down with it, there is a potential cause of contamination especially in, in the wells that are below the higher areas where the roads are and so forth. So uh, if you uh, gentlemen and uh, other water companies in the state of New Hampshire could maybe do a little proactive lobbying up in Concord to get them to uh, revisit perimeters of wells so that we don't have the risk of contamination, uh, I would appreciate it. So just want to clarify. So you're talking about source protection overall? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. Because with the 400 foot, you know, the well is pretty stupid. So. <laughs> Any other questions from the board? I do. Regina. Thank you for uh, the update mm -hmm. on PFAS levels. If we could go back to this one again. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think that was the next one. Whoops. I'll get there. So there. these orange lines represent the proposed MCL that still has to be approved, which didn't really change anything by too much mm. as to what the EPA already has at the 70. I mean, when I looked at it as a layman, mm -hmm. it always was like, well, what's the point? But I'm not really concerned about what DES is doing right now. Um, I'm concerned about what you're doing and I think it's very good because like I've stated for a while that you I think are the ones that got you know you got the testing going former representative Mindy Mesmer is here and she through her work and working on the cancer cluster commission last year with some of our other state reps I think opened up a lot of people's eyes and yeah. you know got the information out there so people can understand it but at the same time, we also have to consider this chart. Those numbers, and I have Mindy Mesmer on as an ex appointment for this very reason, so that mm -hmm. she can, you're an expert and she's an expert. The way I look at it, you two, you communicate all the time and I love that. I know that uh, John Hurley, he and Mindy Mesmer talk and I think that's very good. And I hope that we have another, we have two state reps in the audience today mm -hmm because I received about an hour or so ago that Representative Rennie Cushing is actually appointed by the Speaker of the House yeah. as a House member to the Seacoast Cancer Cluster Commission. Yeah. So that means he resigned as the Hampton rep. So we'll eventually have to be looking to appoint someone to that seat. But I need to make my experiences aware to the public. And I'm gonna do it right here, right now. Mindy Mesmer, when I have questions on any of this, I make sure it goes to her. Mm -hmm. She's become yep. my liaison for this, and I would like that to continue to be. I know she works well with both state and local officials. She works well with you. But at the same time, you are our water guys. <laughs> and as long as you keep these numbers as low and you're continuing to monitor it and to track DES regulation, to track federal regulation, whatever may affect you. Because right now, even if DES were to lower this to what they're suggesting, that's not really gonna affect Aquarian too much, right? Because your numbers are already way lower. Mm -hmm. You're actually close to the lowest, uh, the most conservative stage. 
So I want to point that out. And you're planning on staying on top of this without any any uh, orders from DES or the APA as you have been doing the whole entire time. And you're actually helping them gather information that for whatever reason they seem not motivated enough to do. <laughs> so I appreciate that. And I just wanted to point that out that I hope in the future, <coughs> as long as I sit as a selectman, that you <coughs> and Mesmer and me can keep this going together locally to make sure that we stay on top of it and we inform the public and we don't need regulations, we don't need the state to tell us what to do. We already know what to do right here. Thank you. Yeah, we, we see our role as to uh, provide the water to know what's in the water yeah. and where there's a concern to manage those concerns. So by minimizing the use of well six, by developing new supplies to help redu further reduce the use of the most contaminated wells, that's that's what we're doing about it while the health experts figure out what's the implementation of well 22 will help you yeah but these numbers will be even lower water. when we don't have to use well six at all okay thank you jim upset right yeah <clears throat> i would just like to say that um i had an interesting experience <laughs> recently and i had a liver transplant and <laughs> one of the things that uh they do is they you know they treat they teach you about um you know things that you should avoid and uh like you know uh, buffets and restaurants and stuff like that but one of the things that was most important to them was about water and i thought found that fascinating and they categorized it in three t different types one you know, the community water system like you provide, uh, also <coughs> bottled water, and well water. That, so when you go to someone's house, they said you need to ask people if they're having their water tested, mm. and really you should bring your own water wow. um, and not take a chance. So uh, to me that was fascinating, and the, so I would have thought that it would have been the bottled water that they would have thought was best. But they said, no, it's definitely the community water system because it's so well tested ordinarily sure. um, in most communities. So I thought that was fascinating. Mm. So it's good that you all are doing a good job. It mm. helps a lot of people. And I think it's something that people that have well water ought to take into consideration to have their water tested more often than, mm. well, I don't know how often they do it, but. I never hear anyone say, oh, I had my well water tested. And uh, so mm -hmm. it was a good experience for me. Thank you. The only thing I have is, is there was some discussion here on well 7 and 22. Well 7 and 22 are not surface water wells. They're deep wells, correct? But the water comes yes. down from Woodland Road and goes the right down was, there. Carl, Carl can address yeah. that. Yeah, Carl, will you? Yep, well, well, seven, it's, it's a sand and gravel well, it's 50 or 60 feet deep, so it's, as far as wells go, it's, it's somewhat on the more shallow side. Well 22 is 220 feet deep down yeah. to where we're pulling the water from. Out of bedrock, out of, right. Well right. seven is so, old, it's one of the really old wells. But, no, Mary Louise has a good point. I mean, almost all contamination in water starts out on the surface. Oh, absolutely. For the most part, so, in fact, they'll mention it now, this year we're starting up, it's a, it's a program we do every three years. It's a state requirement um, oriented towards source protection. And mm -hmm. We actually go out, you know, everybody that lives in that aquifer protection zone is going to get some information on you know, how to be a good steward of the stuff you use so that it doesn't contaminate the water. We'll actually do surveys of places that are potential contaminant sources. So mm -hmm. it's all, all tr partly education and partly surveying things to yep. minimize uh, potential contamination in yep. the aquifer. Good. Anything else? We got a few more things if you have time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to again, I'm Dan Lawrence, the director of engineering uh, for Aquarian. Just wanted to bring you up to speed on the Mill Road treatment analysis. Uh, as, as you may remember, we are working on right now a pilot um, comparing the benefit of granular activated carbon and ion exchange. If you recall, in 2017, we did an alternative analysis, look at possible scenarios to treat for the PFAS, and then we went forward with some bench scale testing 
Um, and one of the things, and I'm going to just change slides. Oops. Ooh. Yeah, that's that's. The, where did it go, Carl? Is it two slides over? Yeah, I'm going to skip the slide for a second. Is one of the things that when we came out of the bench scale and the alternative analysis, and this is a little dated because that was la you know, early early last year, so some of the concentrations are a little different because we have more data now. Um, was we look at these scenarios, we were looking at, and just for comparison's sake, no treatment is, is always an alternative. Um, scenario one was just treat for well six, and the last scenario, this is just for the Mill Road well field, mm -hmm. was to treat well six, eight, eight, nine, eleven, which are all the overburden or sand and gravel wells. Wow. And one of the pieces, if you look down at the cost, and that's where I want to remind you of why we're doing what we're doing, is there's a definitely increase in capital costs from the, for the various um, alternatives from not zero, but as an additional cost to 6.1 million. But the estimated annual operating cost, the variability and how often we would have to change media, if you recall, is it was something we were really concerned about. Is it every three weeks? Is it every three months? Is it every three years? And so we've been working on the pilot um, and we had a meeting with our consultant today and that is the pilot. Um, we run, there's a monitoring well immediately adjacent to well six and we pull water out from there and those represent columns of ion exchange and or granular activated carbon and what we're looking for. And, and we are getting better results. Um, wow. They're confirming information and that should really help us as we think about trying to narrow down those operating costs which in the end narrows down the potential rate increase required to address the issue. So mm. that's really why we're doing what we're doing. We have chosen to extend the pilot another three months. It's not going to cost us any more, so that's even better. Um, to get a, a little more data, uh, and when, these kind of, when you're doing pilots, the more information you have, the better. Um, so we're going to be extending that into March. Um, just wanted to let you know that. Originally, we were planning to extend it into January, but it's gone through some cold. It'll hopefully last forever, you know, mm -hmm. last the, the February cold snap I'm sure we'll get. Um, but um, we're looking forward to those results. Mm. And just a few final updates. Uh, did want to mention that we've got some treatment upgrades in the works, a uh, consolidated plan out at Mill Road, mm -hmm. and then one also for the combined flow of well 7 and 22. Mm -hmm. uh, we are working on the groundwater withdrawal permit for well 22. <coughs> got the draft application just last week. It's two inches thick, which is why it's a little bit behind schedule, uh, but we'll be proceeding with that over the next uh, couple of months. It's still our hope that uh, we can use that for production this summer. Although one thing we've got to step back and take a look at is, you, you know, we've got PFAS regs going on. We also have new regs on arsenic coming. And the uh, maximum contaminant level is dropping from 10 down to 5. So we have some wells with some trace levels. Well, 5 is a trace level. So we need to get some more data out of well 22 to see exactly where that stands before you know, we go forward with putting that into, uh, into production. And Dan, if you go to the next one, please. I mentioned our big main replacement project uh, for this year is replacing the pipe that cuts across the marsh uh, down along Route 101. Um, a lot of the same environment that the town has dealt with with your sewer project, and mm -hmm. you well know the expense yeah. of having to deal with leaks out there. So we're, you know, looking at that and thinking we need to do something uh, sooner rather than later. So uh, basically, come off Tide Mill Road, come across 101 come down the opposite side of the town's sewer project mm -hmm. to Glade Path and then can connect back into the system. So um, that's on the books. And I think I've got one more slide. Just yeah, our environmental champions for the years coming up. Chance to uh, call out those people and organizations that really demonstrate excellence in promoting our natural resources. Um, so stay tuned. We'll be looking for nominations soon. And we've got our event time for May 9th of this the spring, so. Okay. May Louise? Gentlemen, I want to make a personal plea. And you and I have known each other a long time, Carl. Please, when you're doing projects, notify manager and give an idea of what impact might take place on the community. I found the dirty water coming out of my sink what, the, the summer, and I called Fred and said, what on earth is going on? And Fred finds out everything. So he said, just run the water for 15 minutes. It did clear, but it was an unusual thing. I don't usually see dirty water coming out of my, my faucets. 
But this recent incident, and I'm going to tell you, I was not happy. I was not happy, and you know that. I have worked with the water company in Hampton since Hampton Water Works. When you came on board, you came into town, moved in. I served on the uh, Aquarian Customer Advisory Council, except when I was a selectman, then I would step down. I think I have been uh, somewhat helpful to you folks over the years. I don't ever want another incident like what happened with that water pressure. When you know you are working on, and in that case, I guess you were working on well 22, where there's a possibility of either dirt contamination or what, I never saw anything like that air coming out of my faucet. I thought it was gonna break the faucet out and hit the ceiling. That is a terrifying sight to see, that air coming out of your pipe. And what I, you, you need to call, you need to notify Fred, please send him an email or something that you're going to be working. Nothing may happen, but you're gonna be working on such and such a location in case something happens, uh, then we'll have an idea what's going on. And uh, I suggest that at least once a year, when you mail out bills, put in like a small business card giving the customers an emergency number to call. I called the police department, and that dispatcher was wonderful. I explained that I had an, an awful problem, and she was so good, she located your technician and who called me back about 10 minutes later. Call, tell people that to call, and I, I don't think you're gonna have floods of them, but the, the people can call the Hampton Police Department, but the police department needs to know from you if there may be a problem somewhere along the line. Now, your technician was very nice. Um, he told me when he called me from Seabrook that he'd need an outside line to bleed the air from the system. So I said, okay, I have an outside faucet right next to the driveway. I went down in the cellar. I had shut off the outside water faucets at the end of September. But I went down and I opened up the outside faucet and when I was, I had to go to a planning board meeting that night, so I backed down my driveway and the technician was there, he did come. I did have calls from other residents on Little River Road who were seeing the same problem. And after that I had calls from people all the way down High Street as far as Dunvegan Woods who had some air in their system. but the technician was there, and as I backed out, the faucet was practically shaking itself off the side of the house. I don't know how much water was used when you cleared that line, but when I got home, the water was all the way down the driveway, all the way up to the barn. I don't know how many gallons were used. I went in the house, and I had left the cellar light on so I wouldn't forget the faucet downstairs, got downstairs, secured the faucet again, and the floor was full of water. My house was built in 1903. The faucet's up close to the house. I never use the outdoor faucets unless they're hooked up to the hose, but they weren't hooked up to the hose then. It would have been probably pretty stupid if it was. But my cellar floor is all full of water because it leaks through the stone foundation. If you don't think I was cross, I'm telling you now, okay, I so. was mad. So we need, just give us a heads up, that's all. Give us a heads up and tell us. We're, we're doing pipes at such and such a location, there might be a problem. They may never be. In fact, you had a nice technician come home, come to my home last fall to replace the water meter because it was 10 okay, years old. Mary Louise, Didn't can you I make your point, Wait a please? Minute. I called you up and I congratulated you on having such a nice employee, and he was. He was a very, very nice person. So I don't usually holler at you, but I'm telling you, we better have a little more heads up for the residents. Let the manager know what's going on. If there's a problem, forget it. If there's no problem, forget it. If there is a problem, please notify people. Thank please. you. Please. And Regina. don't forget that little card at least once a year with an emergency number on it. Regina? Yeah, I have a couple questions. I meant to ask uh, John Hurley, he, mm. I know that website, 
that was uh, a lot of us didn't know, like, didn't necessarily like the way it was stated on there. I know uh, Mindy Mesmer had some qualms with it. It was pretty much saying that Coakley had nothing to do mm-hmm. with uh, uh, contamination. Yeah. Could you explain what the company has done with that? Yes. Yeah, so. The original statements uh, were put up there because some people were saying that uh, Coakley was definitively uh, causing the contamination in the Mill Road well. Mm -hmm. So we were saying, uh, based on the uh, advice of our expert consultant, we were saying no, they're not. And as the the, uh, discussion continued over the months, uh, it was pointed out that there, there really isn't conclusive evidence either way. And so we softened the statement uh, to say that, you know, more study is needed. At this point in time, uh, there is not any evidence that I'm aware of and that our consultant is aware of that says, you know, here's proof that Coakley is contaminating uh, any of our wells. Uh, So we we reworded the statement uh, because more testing is going to be done and we will see what uh, the outcome of that testing is. Thank you. And I have w- actually one for each of them. Now the next <laughs> one's for Carl. Um, well 22. Compared to well 6, what is the, like forget about the PFAS for a minute, what is the capacity of that well compared to, Huge. like what will that well capacity do? It's about three times yeah. the capacity yeah. in terms of just per producing water compared to six. So for all this growth we have happening that's most likely to continue, that is something that sub- substantially could assist I'm our sorry. water supply. Well, we were talking upstairs about all the growth that the town's experiencing. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's probably still going to continue It'll to It'll certainly help us meet future demands for quite mm-hmm. some time, assuming we get it permitted for the full amount. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. And the last question I have is for... Um, Dan, we were talking upstairs about the 101 main replacement, how you have to go through a similar type of uh, procedure, I guess you call it, that we had to go through for our mosh pipes. And you have to work with those same state agencies and do those same type of what we have to do to get all our permitting and things like that. Do you foresee any problems going forward? We just, I'm saying this now because we have our two of our state reps here. We have Patricia Bushway and we also have Mike Edgar. So. I know there was a little uncertainty upstairs, <laughs> and I think that maybe now's the time to uh, state it on camera what we have. Yeah, so we were, um, uh, as Carl discussed, we we're planning to replace our uh, water main, take it out of the tidal marsh, and, and put it in a place we can uh, work on it, which is the edge of Route 101. Uh, we have prepared um, design plans and submitted permit applications. Um, we're getting ready to submit to New Hampshire DOT. Um, for an access permit, um, those, you know, and th- those are these are challenging areas, as we all know, both from a traffic point of view. Uh, we had that conversation. We we have met um, Fred, and we had a meeting with um, the town's consultant, our consultant, and New Hampshire DOT early on, mm-hmm. as um, the town is really ahead of us in terms of getting their sewer, your sewer project complete. Um, so you're at least underway, and we wanted to make sure and coordinate with that. Um, a lot of the work is is similar. Um, you know, but um, in the area where um, the town's going to basically put the pipes up on a pipe bridge, we're going to be directional drilling around the bridge. So a little difference there, but um, for the most part. So, we, you know, we, we want to build that this year. Uh, that's our plan so that mm-hmm. basically the town can build the sewer, we can build the water, and then a New Hampshire DOT has plans to re- restore the roadway, and that would be the proper sequence. So is there any damage to the roadway for any reason for them, those projects? It doesn't get on a brand new roadway it's yeah. after the fact so that is a tight schedule to do all that for one year but i think it's very doable um with all permits in place for everybody and so. that water supplies the water to hampton beach yes that's a hampton beach uh and uh, we know you had an, an issue out there on the sewer and no offense but we don't want to do that as well we'd prefer not to have to do that so it's one of two transmission mains to the beach and it handles probably two-thirds of the summer demand yeah. So that's pretty important. So from a fire protection standpoint, yeah. it's very critical. So why it's a critical main, so that's why we're addressing the issue. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Jim? Uh, thank you, guys. Rick? Thank you for your report. You're welcome. Kyle, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Don't forget West of 95. Well, but here's what I'm going to say. As a resident, from your remarks earlier, I've lived in four states, paid taxes in four states. I 
I think I get a lot of value out of the property taxes I pay here in Hampton. That's good to hear. So. Absolutely. So thank you very much, John. You're welcome. Appreciate thank it. Thank you.